Well, this week it's done nothing but absolutely chuck it down. We know we're in April now with the uh, April showers. Um, it's reasonably warm, but uh, we've had loads of wind. Um, the wind vane's still standing just about, but um, it's been really wet and I just can't do anything on the uh, allotment as, as of yet. So um, there's plenty more to do in the greenhouse. So welcome to another episode of Jim's Allotment Garden. So I just want to do a quick uh, comment section from all the comments that we got last week. The first one's from um, Janice Holland and uh, she was asking about, um, well she put a comment about um, cherry, um, cherry tomatoes and she was saying that um, she, uh, she always grows cherry tomatoes. The one that she actually recommends is Sun Gold F1. Um, so what I might do um, Janice is I might actually go and try and get some of them seeds from the garden centre and uh, give them a go. I have put some um, cherry uh, tomatoes in from last year, but I will almost certainly give the Sun um, Gold F1 a try this year. Uh, the next one's from um, Antonio Pachi Rocco. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that particularly well. Um, and he was talking about um, potatoes in sand, and basically I think he... Uh, I think his ground's quite sort of sandy and, and um, stuff like that. And he was saying, that, will potatoes grow okay? Well, there's no reason, you know, as long as you've got enough organic material in there. I mean, most, most um, soils in the UK are quite sandy. Uh, my my um, um, ground here is sort of reasonably sandy. Uh, but uh, as, as long as you've got the one thing that you need to, uh, with, with potatoes, the one thing that you need in there is plenty of um, organic material because you need to hold the moisture in there and obviously you also need the you know the sort of the nutrients from um, sort of muck and stuff like that so when I'm always putting the uh, potatoes in I always make sure there's plenty of straw goes in and plenty of muck and um, you know your potatoes should grow okay so the one thing you know obviously that you need with potatoes is moisture you know you need to keep as much moisture in the ground as possible so um, I would suggest you know that if you have got sandy soil that you put plenty of uh, um, you know sort of organic material in there, you know, as much compost and, and, and muck as, 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 as possible basically for your potatoes. And he also put a comment on um, to say that um, the British people aren't particularly adventurous when it comes to uh, um, tomato um, varieties that we grow. And we always tend to grow the same, car uh, you know, sort of same ones. Now, a couple of years ago, um, we did a bit of an experiment to be honest with you and um, a friend of my um, father's he grew possibly about about 20 different varieties of tomatoes and um, we all we all sort of had one or two of each of the um, different tomatoes and I um, I grew them in not this particular greenhouse the greenhouse was actually in my garden so it was the other greenhouse that I've got um, and in there um, you know there was about sort of I think I had about 15 different varieties of um, tomatoes and in all honesty, you know, I mean, the, you know, the tomatoes that you can get, you know, there are some really sort of, you know, nice looking ones, you know, there's different coloured ones, you know, you can get quite dark ones or you can get pale ones or green ones, uh, or you can get sort of tiger stripe ones and all the rest of it. But really, with the weather that we've got in the UK, really our, our, our sort of conditions, and really I'm talking about sunlight, really only, only, um, you know, it's only really good for a, a reasonably small um, sort of number of varieties. And you can tell that by really the varieties that you get in garden centres. Because really a garden centre will only hold probably half a dozen or so varieties of tomatoes. Even though, you know, there's possibly 40 or 50 different types of uh, uh, tomatoes you can get. Uh, purely because, you know, most of them don't grow particularly well in the UK. And even though, you, you know, you will get fruits and you will get... Um, you know, sort of healthy plants. The yield on them isn't particularly good, and uh, and you know, I think the more sort of traditional ones that we grow in the UK are probably best suited for our um, for our sort of 
you know, sort of, uh, basically amount of sunlight that we get. And obviously we grow um, tomatoes sort of primarily in greenhouses in the UK. And uh, but the the one thing that we really struggled with 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 um, plants like tomatoes is the sheer amount of sunlight that we get. I mean, we can't compete with um, sort of you know sort of South Europe, uh, you know, sort of Spain, South of France, Italy, Turkey, and stuff like that. You know, I mean, tomatoes over there grow like weeds, and you know we just can't compete with that because you know purely because of the uh, you know the amount of light that we get and the you know the length of the uh, the growing season. Uh, anyway, he was saying that he's going to grow some varieties this year, and uh, the ones that he's got are White Beauty. Um, there's an orange, uh, something or other, orange Russian, uh, black plum, green, uh, Libra, yellow pear, joint Belgium, and all of those he's going to grow in his greenhouse. And then he's also got um, um, Corelic and um, Totten Bush, which he's going to grow outside. I'm assuming that he's actually in Italy or something like that. I'm not quite sure where he is uh, sort of located. But uh, you know he's going to grow you know a, a sort of reasonable variety of uh, tomatoes, and I think in the UK I think we have got sort of I don't know possibly ten different varieties that we can um, pick from, but um, that's that's possibly why we're perhaps not as adventurous as uh, you know sort of southern Europe and other you know obviously other parts of the world that you that kind of latitude. Um, the next comment comes from Shannon Robinson, and she was um, she was saying that last year she actually grew some um, fingling carrots, which are the small sort of carrots about the size of your finger. She said she grew them um, with her uh, tomatoes and she said she, uh, she had a really good crop of um, carrots off there and also she said the, the tomatoes with the carrots grown amongst them seemed to do better than uh, you know you know had a better yield on it than, than the, uh, the tomato plants that she had that, that hadn't got the carrots in so um, possibly you know you've got a um, um, you know, sort of a couple of plants there that sort of enjoy each other's um, uh, sort of company. So, you, you know, you can get these sort of sort of symbiotic relationships between different plants. I've never heard of carrots and um, uh, tomatoes before, but um, anyway, Shannon said she had some quite good um, success last year. And the results that she got seemed to, um, seemed to suggest that um, both, the, both the carrots and the tomatoes did well from being planted with each other. So that's possibly something that we can um, try this year. Um, um, she said that she hasn't um, planted a leech yet, um, but her seasons are slightly um, later than the UK. So um, she said she's going to put them in the next few weeks. But uh, it just goes to show you the sort of the seasons. Even even in the UK, you know, you do get um, sort of seasonal differences between you know sort of the southern uh, parts of England and the you know sort of up in Scotland and stuff like that. You can get you know just over those you know sort of few hundred miles. You know you can get. Um, you know, I mean, Britain's probably about four or five hundred miles from top to bottom, and um, you know, you can, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, Britain's probably somewhere around there, about 400, 450 miles, something like that, and um, you know, you can see quite a difference in the, um, you know, the timings where people are actually planting stuff in the ground. So um, anyway, the next one's from um, um, Dave Rawks, and he's um, hi Dave, and he said. Uh, where to put coffee in the ground? Well, coffee's coffee's good for a number of reasons. Um, and these are the coffee grounds that he's got from Starbucks or you know, or sort of you know, you know, somewhere like that. And um, I use them, I use them for sort of two reasons really. Um, if you put um, if you put a lot of um, sort of organic material in the ground, sort of um, you know, most certainly unrotted. Um, Sort of compost, you know, any sort of kitchen scraps or anything like that, or if you put straw or, or sort of wood chippings or anything like that, the microbes that are going to break all that down in the ground are going to take the nitrogen out of the ground. So if you dig in a load of um, if you dig in a load of straw or, or wood chippings or, or just just normal compost without it breaking down, um, it can draw all the nitrogen out of the ground because the you know the sort of the microbes, the bacteria and stuff like that, which are going to break all that compost down into nutrients for your plants, are going to take all the nitrogen out of the plants. So by putting coffee with that, uh, what you're doing is you're you're adding extra nitrogen, if you like, in the ground. So so by the time the uh, the bacteria have finished breaking up the um, the compost in the ground, uh, you're going to have a reasonable level of uh, nitrogen in there. 
Uh, obviously this, this exactly the same thing applies if you're composting. If you're going to put, um, if you can get yourself some coffee grounds, some used coffee grounds, these are ideal. So when you're building your compost, put in, um, you know, put in your kitchen scraps and your, your straw and all your wood chippings or whatever, um, you, you know, your trimmings and stuff. Um, and then putting a handful of um, nitrogen in there will again boost the um, boost the actual um, sort of breakdown of those um, you know sort of materials that you put in there by the bacteria because the bacteria needs nitrogen to basically um, you know to multiply and, and, and do its thing so by putting nitrogen into your compost as well has exactly the same effect um, so obviously that's another way but uh, the other time that I use um, coffee is um, is when I'm putting in um, plants that you want the leaves basically so anything that you need to leave from um, so all of your sort of brassicas mainly you know your kale your your um, uh, what lettuce um, you know stuff like that. plants that you grow you, you know you sort of eat the leaves off those are the ones you want to encourage to you know sort of grow the leaves so putting nitrogen in the ground will um, will sort of give them a bit of a boost um, the other um, uh, the other plants that I wouldn't put um, sort of coffee on too much are uh, uh, things that you want to eat the roots of. Um, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't put a lot of nitrogen where I'm going to put the potatoes because uh, obviously you get lots of tops and, and, and no potatoes underneath sort of thing. So, you know, you want them to focus on growing the, you know, the tubers, the potatoes rather than the, you know, the actual stalks and the, and the leaves. So, even though where I'm putting the potatoes, I've put some coffee. Uh, I've been careful how much I've put, so I don't know if you saw a few videos ago, but I was digging a row probably um, probably about uh, about 10 foot wide. So every row that I, I sort of dug, I put in a couple of shovels of, um, you know, a couple of good shovels of, of uh, manure, um, straw and stuff like that, which is mainly straw, and I also put some wood chippings in there. And then what I put on top of that was probably... Uh, probably a pot about about sort of that big of um, coffee. I don't know if you can see that. But I was putting uh, probably about half a pint of coffee grounds along the row. No more than I, you know, no more than that because I don't want the the ground to be too rich in in uh, nitrogen. Um, other places you can use nitrogen, obviously, is uh, sorry, coffee is um, you know for lawns. You know, you can you can you know sort of sprinkle it on your lawn to you know to improve your your lawn grade. I don't do that because I don't want to cut the um, grass twice a week, but uh, you know you can if you've if you've got a a big a, you know a bit of lawn that's struggling, uh, you know putting a bit of coffee on there will almost certainly help to bring that up. So that's the uh, the coffee. But basically, you're looking for plants that need nitrogen to grow properly. Uh, the next one's from uh, Liam McNally, and he was saying, um, when do you plant your potatoes? Well, there's no hard and fast rule to this, really. You plant your potatoes when it's warm enough. Um, now, really, in in sort of Britain, I mean, um, Liam's over in Bromsgrove, which is which is not far from me. Um, but basically, I haven't put any potatoes in yet. I grow um, kestrel, which are second earlies, but I grow them like main crop. So, the difference between growing earlies and main crop uh, are uh, main crop. You want to be planting the potatoes, the seed potatoes, about 15 inches apart. And you want the the rows to be about 30 inches apart. So you plant your potatoes about that far apart, and the rows need to be about you know kind of that far apart. Um, if you're growing um, earlies, um, those you basically grow a lot closer together. So you actually plant the potatoes only a foot apart, which is kind of that much, um, you know, so 12 inches or 30 centimeters. And then you want the the rows only to be um, sort of 20 inches apart. So you know, kind of. About that much, um, and with early potatoes, you're really digging them up, um, sort of quite early on. So you know when the potatoes are only sort of sort of that big, so they're not really fully formed. Obviously, with new potatoes, you know you want to have that sort of uh, sort of freshness to them, and the you know they're not fully grown yet. That's 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 sort of how you're picking uh, or, or sort of digging up. Um, sort of early potatoes, main crop potatoes. You let them run the course, and you know, and you don't really cut the tops off until they start dying back. When you know the tubes have got to, you know, as large as they possibly can be. So, uh, you know, obviously, main crop potatoes are in the ground for about another three or four weeks more than, more than you know, sort of early potatoes. So that's why you need an extra bit of room in there, um, and obviously, you want bigger potatoes as well. 
if you want to store potatoes over the winter, you don't want to store early potatoes. Um, you know, you want to be storing um, sort of main crop potatoes. That's what you store for over the winter. Um, and the way I eat potatoes, I do like new potatoes, but uh, because I've already got half the half the uh, allotment filled with um, potatoes anyway. Uh, I I only tend to grow sort of main crop potatoes and then any early potatoes I actually buy them to be honest with you. Um, so that's um, that's the best thing I can give uh, for potatoes. But if we're talking about kind of timing wise, I would say you plant your potatoes um, from mid March to kind of mid April, um, on the understanding that um, it's going to take two or three weeks before you actually see them to, uh, you know sort of coming out the ground. And basically what you don't want to do is have the tops um, exposed, because obviously you're going to hold them up. You don't want the tops exposed till basically the end of May. Because uh, obviously we can still get, in the UK anyway, In because uh, in the UK we can get frosts right up until the end of May. And what you don't want to do is get the, the tops of the potatoes frost damaged. Because uh, the potatoes won't recover from that basically. So if your potato tops do start to come out of the ground before... Uh, the end of May, you need to start sort of hoeing them up and sort of burying them again because if you get a, a snap of frost, which we can do right up until the end of May, um, that's going to wipe your potato crops out if you're not careful. So um, I haven't I haven't planted my potatoes yet. I'm I'm hopefully going to do it soon with the weather. Obviously at the moment it's it's uh, it's like the sun out there, so I you know I can't really uh, get on. But uh, what I would suggest is over the next week or so plant your onions if you haven't already and then possibly the week after that, hopefully when we've got a bit more dry, uh, dry weather, um, get your potatoes in. The main crop, really by now you should have got your earlies in, if, if, if you are growing earlies. So if you've not got your earlies in, really you need to get them in this weekend or you know as, as, as soon as you possibly can do. Really with earlies you don't need to worry too much. Um, uh, the, thing, the, the thing that really does the timing is really you're cropping early potatoes, much earlier anyway, but your main crop potatoes, really you can be taken out of the ground in sort of back end of July, August time. And that's when you get the, the blight come through. So what I always try to do is plant them as early as possible without any risk of them being damaged by the frost. Um, and then um, basically as soon as sort of July comes, really I want the plants to have flowered by then so the tops start dying off. As soon as the tops start dying off, I typically cut the lot off and you know cut them right down to the ground. Then I leave the potatoes in the ground for about another three weeks, four weeks. Um, I think the uh, the Royal Horticultural Society actually recommends you dig them out within a fortnight of taking the tops off. Uh, but I tend to leave them about a month. I find that the if you leave them in the ground a bit longer, the uh, the potatoes actually form a harder skin. Um, and if they've got a, a harder skin, um, they, they store better over, you know, for over the winter. And obviously the majority of the potatoes that I grow, I want to store them in sacks for over the winter. And you can tell when you... If a, if a potato's basically still growing, if you dig it up, if you rub your thumb on the potato, you'll find that the skin peels off and you get like sort of flakes of potato skin coming off. What you want, when you store your potatoes, what you want is, is if you rub the potato nothing flakes off and, and then you know the potatoes skin is hardened and that's going to protect your potato against all sorts of fungus and, 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 and you know sort of disease and stuff over the winter whilst you're storing it so if you are wanting to store your potatoes like me what I would suggest unless you've got loads of slugs in your ground because obviously you don't want the slugs to start eating your potatoes but um, if you can leave your potatoes in the ground for three or four weeks after you've taken the tops off in July so basically you plant your potato, you, your main crops kind of now, um, or, or at least in the next fortnight, and then they'll grow, and then sort of towards the mid of middle of July, that's when you take the tops off, and you can tell because they start to die back. That's when you take the tops off, um, unless you've got blight, which obviously you take them off anyway, and dispose of them, and then leave them in the ground then for another four weeks. So then you then you sort of um, August September. So really, you know, that's, um, you know, you want to be digging them up sort of mid to late September, uh, possibly into October. If, you know, you can take your time. I don't think it's, uh, unless you're, you know, you've got loads of slugs in your garden. 
to be honest with you, I mean, if you go back to the Victorian times, what they used to do was uh, they used to dig a trench in the ground, and then they used to put sand in the bottom of the trench. They used to dig all the potatoes up and put the, the potatoes in the trench, and then bury the potatoes again with with all the sand or dirt. And then um, you know they used to have these potato mounds, but basically basically covered in dirt. And then as and when they needed the potatoes, they'd just go to where they buried them and dig them back up. If you leave them in the ground, it's pretty much the same thing. So if you're if you're struggling to um, store potatoes, leave them in the ground. That's the best place for them, to be honest with you. Um, what I tend to do is it depends on the weather. If the weather's still warm towards the back of the year, if I dig the potatoes out, they're going to start going soft and they won't store particularly well. So if we're having a warm water, uh, autumn, what I'll do is I'll actually leave them in the ground a bit longer and not dig them up until um, sort of October, mid, mid to late October. So they've actually been in the ground without any tops on for about eight weeks. Um, what I find then is obviously they've hard enough anyway, but when I dig them up, it's cool. So when I store them in the garage or the shed, um, you know, it's, it's cool enough for them to stay, um, you know, sort of fresh in the, uh, the sacks. Because if it's too warm, you know, they're going to go all soft and start, you know, sort of dehydrating stuff in the sacks and, and get sweaty if it's, you know, if it's too hot. So uh, that's the best advice I can give you on the potatoes. Uh, the next one's from, um, oh, I've had a couple of uh, comments really on this next one. One's from um, Paul Mervyn and Steve Parker, and they were talking about this skull that's in the back here. Now, this, this skull I've had for possibly 20 years and I can assure you it is plastic you know it's it's a it's a rubberized uh, skull that I got oh, I don't know it was, it was some uh, um, Halloween or something like that when about 20 years ago I bought these things and I did originally have two of them and uh, basically because it's been in the garage for about uh, oh, about 20 years basically since I've had it it's got this mold on it so it does look a lot more realistic than it perhaps would do normally um, but uh, I can assure you, it's not my neighbour or my wife or anything like that. It's um, I, it's in the greenhouse because I had it on the video on the Halloween, and um, I've just I haven't, I haven't taken it back out of the greenhouse. But uh, I can assure you, unless you want to do your sort of Shakespeare, a last boy Yorick, I knew him well, a ratio, a, a man of infinite jest, all that stuff. Um, it's it's just in here because it was for Halloween. But uh, I thought I'd keep it there anyway, just to. Detour anybody that might come in the green house trying to nick stuff. Well, not that we get that lot with anyway. But um, anyway, don't worry about the skull. I'm, I can assure you he's perfectly harmless because he's just ahead. <laughs> um, right, the next one's from uh, where are we now? Um, Ken Fuller. He was saying, Do you plant lettuce in direct sunlight? Um, I tend to, um, to be honest with it. I've, I've, I've put lettuce in the, um, the green house here between the, uh, the tomatoes. And uh, I normally plant it out in the allotment um, in direct sunlight. Uh, you haven't got to with lettuce. Lettuce is one of those um, vegetables you can actually grow in the shade. And uh, Ken was saying that uh, if you um, if you grow it in direct sunlight, it, it, it reduces the chance of it bolting. I think, or I'm not sure which way Randy was trying to say. But uh, to be honest with you, I find with lettuce, if you don't want it to bolt keep it watered. Um, I find with lettuce and also spinach and um, sort of not, not kale so much but most certainly spinach, uh, definitely spinach, spinach beet um, and lettuce and lettuce leaf and all that kind of stuff. Um, as long as you keep it well watered it won't bolt on you. Um, it's, it's when plants like that dry out. Um, that's possibly direct sunlight because obviously direct sunlight will make it sort of dry out. Um, but um, I don't really think that it matters because I've grown I've grown lettuce in shaded areas, and I've also grown lettuce in um, direct sunlight, where it's getting sunlight for sort of I don't know five uh, no hang on twelve twelve or more hours a day it's getting sunlight direct sunlight and it, it it's it's never really had a problem either way to be honest with you. I do find if you grow lettuce in a, a more shaded area. Um, that it tends to be bigger, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that when I do Mother Nature Part 18 because I'm going to be talking about sunlight anyway. But um, really, with lettuce, you can grow it in shaded or unshaded, and I think the main thing that stops it from bolting, to be honest with you, Ken, uh, I could be wrong, but I think that the thing that stops lettuce from bolting is keeping it wet. If you keep lettuce wet, 
because they grow really quickly so they need lots of water. Um, if you keep lettuce wet then it won't bolt. It's when you let it go dry and you, you know you perhaps forget to water it for a couple of days and it goes dry, that's when lettuce will bolt. I think that's the main cause for um, bolting. Uh, and if you, don't, if you don't know what bolting means, that's when basically uh, any plant will sort of set up, um, send up its central shoot and basically run to seed, so basically the, the, uh, the seed sort of, you know, sort of thing in the middle. Uh, but that's, uh, that's basically when you get um, basically bolted. Uh, the next one uh, comes from Nigel from Muddy Boots in Wolverhampton. Um, and he was saying, uh, am I going to grow the um, Alicante inside or outside? Now, Alicante, I think, I'm pretty sure, uh, Alicante is actually an indoor variety, so I'm, I'm going to be growing it in the greenhouse. I am going to be growing tomatoes outside this year as well. Uh, which I didn't do last year or the year before. I have done it in the past. Um, I'm not sure what varieties I'm going to get yet for the for the outside. But what I tend to do is plant the the tomatoes I'm going to grow outside a little bit later on, um, because I don't want to plant them outside when the plants are too big. You know, I want them to sort of keep them reasonably small whilst they're in the greenhouse, so that when they do go out, it's nice and warm because they're going to go out a little bit later. And you know the plants aren't pot bound or anything like that, which is obviously something I'm avoiding. So uh, I am going to grow one or two varieties for outside as well this year. I'm not sure what varieties yet, um, but um, I will look into that and I'll let you know over the next couple of weeks. I will be planting them in the next sort of couple of weeks, so um, I'll uh, keep you posted on that. But in the greenhouse, I'm going to be growing um, Alicante and Moneymaker, and I'm going to mix them up to see which is the best out of the two. Um, and um, I'm also going to be growing some cherry tomatoes which I've planted but I might also get the Sun Gold F1 from Janice's um, comment um, just to see what they're like. Uh, I don't grow many of the, uh, the the small cherry ones, I only grow one or two plants to be honest with you because they're just for, you know, you, you know, you get loads of tomatoes anyway. But um, right, the, and the other comment that he made um, uh, which, is, uh, which is actually a, a good comment from Nigel he said, with, when you dig your club roots out, with the, you know, the brassicas have got club roots, um, he says, when you dig them out, clean your boots and your tools off as well. And he, that's a very good point. So I will be um, taking up on that. I, I, I forgot to mention that last week, uh, Nigel. And the other th not thing that Nigel said, he said, what do you put in with your potatoes for fertiliser? Now, I'm going to be putting some um, blood fish and bone in. Um, and I'm going to be putting some of this in. So what I, what I typically do is, uh, that's the um, blood fish and bone meal. And what I typically do, be careful with this stuff, it, it is actually carcinogenic if you're not careful, or, or, or some varieties of it. I know that isn't, but uh, what I would suggest, if you don't know if it is um, non-carcinogenic, don't handle blood, fish and bone with your hands. What I suggest you do is uh, get yourself a little um, scoop or something like that, or just sprinkle it in out of, a, out of a tub. Pour that into a tub and then just sprinkle a bit over the ground, but don't handle it with your hands too much, because uh, it... it it does come with a some some makes of it come with a uh, a sort of health guideline not to touch it with bare skin. So use gloves or, or, or put it in a tub if you don't like wearing gloves like me. Uh, put it in a tub and sprinkle it in with you know sort of one hand. But uh, that's what I'm going to be putting in. I'm also going to be I'm also going to be, um, also going to be uh, watering the uh, the tomatoes with uh, comfrey. Sorry, the, uh, the, the the tomatoes, but also the potatoes with comfrey juice as well. Um, you know, sort of later on, just to give them a bit of a boost. But uh, from an organic point of view, I'm going to be putting um, blood fish and bone meal, which is a slow release fertilizer. And um, obviously, I've dug loads of muck in and stuff like that on the ground anyway. So um, hopefully, I should get a good crop. Um, you know, just by doing that and giving them a bit of a boost with the uh, the comfrey. Um, so that's the potatoes. The last one comes from Terry King, and he says, "Where do you use uh, the wood ash? Wood ash is good for a, a, a whole." Um, raft of uh, reasons really. Uh, I think your wood ash is best um, placed on your potatoes to be honest with you um, because for two reasons one it's it's high in um, you know it's high in carbon so you're going to get a lot of carbon dioxide coming out so you uh, you know you, you know, you're going to get a lot of um, as it breaks down in the in the ground you're going to get a lot of carbon dioxide given off um, and then the plant's going to absorb that through its leaves and, it, and, and then the plant's going to be able to turn that into fructose and, and uh, glucose 
which is then going to go down to make your potatoes. So most certainly, um, and obviously as you know, um, potatoes are starch basically, the glucose. So uh, basically, um, any any root vegetable, I would say um, to use um, ash. But to be honest with you, you can use it on anything. Um, the other reason to use it on potatoes is um, slugs don't like ash, and uh, if you put that in the ground, you're going to deter any potential um, slugs or eelworms and stuff in the ground. So uh, I would I would always tend to use it on my potatoes rather than anything else. Uh, but you can use you can use wood ash anywhere. Uh, potato, um, your tomatoes will thank you for putting it on them as well. Too, but obviously tomatoes and potatoes are a very similar plant. Uh, but basically, you can put it anywhere. It's it, it's good for anything. If if you know anybody um, that's got a coal fire, um, get the coal ash. That is like gold dust for an allotment. Um, because the thing is with um, coal dust is not only does it have a lot of carbon, it's obviously because it's carbon ash, but it's also got sulphur in it. And the good thing about sulphur is it most certainly kills slugs. So um, <coughs> if you can get coal ash, what I suggest you do is when you plant your potatoes, dig your dig your trench or your or your sort of your hole. I always dig holes for my potatoes rather than a trench. But uh, dig your hole put your um, put your um, your potato in the hole and then the soil that you're going to put back into the hole what you want to do is put some coal ash and some blood fish and bone in there with it and then put that back in the hole on top of the potato that's the best way of planting potatoes um, because the coal dust has got sulfur in it which is going to kill the slugs off um, or at least deter them if nothing else um, and obviously you've got the carbon there in the ash to give you loads of carbon dioxide for the plant to, to breathe and to produce the fructose gl glucose da, da, da. and also you know you've got all of your um, you know your sort of um, you know your, your sulfurs and your phosphates and stuff like that in the blood and fish uh, uh, meal uh, blood fish and bone meal um, which is then going to obviously break down in the ground and then obviously feed it you know, feed your potato plants as they uh, as they grow. So that's the best way of planting potatoes. But I will be showing you this as soon as I put them in this year when we get a dry day. Um, I will show you uh, me doing that. So um, the other thing you can do is if you don't grow particularly organically, obviously the other thing you can do is when you plant your potatoes, put a handful of grow more in there with them. Um, not not sort of too much, you know, just a you know literally just a you know small handful of grow more in the ground on top of the potatoes then obviously that's a fast release that'll give you a plant a bit of a boost as well for you know to start with so that was the questions for uh, this week so I hope this episode of Jim's Lotlands has been of some use to you um, obviously if you've got any comments or questions please do put them below and I'll get back to you and I'll um, I'll sort of answer as best I can um, to any questions or I'll bring it up in uh, one of the next episodes and uh, I just want to say a big thank you to all of the new subscribers. I do appreciate um, you subscribing to the channel. And I shall be seeing you on the next episode with Dorothy. Oh, Jim's long ago. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey! <laughs>